It's fine. All right, Ephesians 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Jay. Well, as we come to our text this morning, it starts with the word, therefore. And my college pastor always told me, hey, when you see a therefore, ask, what is the therefore, therefore? That sounds so silly, sounds funny, because you just want to say it again and again. Say it 10 times fast. No, don't. It is there because Paul is pointing us back to truth that he was talking about in chapters one to three. And if you haven't been around for chapters one to three, you can go online and you can watch or listen to the podcast, things like that. You can listen to those messages and, and that would be great truth to have. And it's really important that you understand that rich gospel truth because Paul, who's a prisoner for the Lord, as we read, he's a prisoner for the Lord because he got so excited about the gospel of the Lord Jesus that he was willing to go to prison. And he was, he was likely writing this letter chained to a Roman guard, and he was, he was totally willing to do that, and he gets excited about the gospel, even in the midst of prison, because he was excited about what Jesus had done. You know, in the first three chapters, we learned that God saw us in our helpless estate, and we were, we were lost, we were separated from his people, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, he made us alive together with him. So if you've trusted in Christ, he's made us alive in Christ, made us part of his family, and there's so much other stuff. We can't go through everything from chapters one to three, but all that goodness that's there. And if you've never trusted in Christ, you are in the right place this morning. The offer is free for you to respond to the gospel because Jesus died and paid the penalty for our sins. And all we need to do is repent and believe in him and we can become part of his family. So all that good stuff, therefore, Paul is saying, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So when you think about that statement, immediately when we think about moving from this deep theological truth in the beginning of the book, Paul's turning the corner saying, okay, now live in light of this deep theological truth. In fact, the word worthy in the original kind of has the, um, the sense of, of a scale, like something that is worthy. Now, when you look at the scale, just in all, in all honesty, um, having this scale, it, it isn't actually a scale because you're like, hey, it doesn't balance. Um, yeah, because for some reason, you know, the picture online was so exciting. I didn't think, to, is it actually a scale? So <laughs> I make mistakes. Uh, hopefully uh, you can relate to that. Maybe not. Um, so, but there, there's a scale. But even bringing this out, I was kind of hesitant because when, when a scale is brought out, immediately we're like, okay, if I'm put on the scale, right? And, uh, you know, this is the only, only little character I knew that would stand up. You, immediately you're like, I, I don't measure up. Like, I'm just not going to measure up. I'm not going to balance the scale. Now, the beauty of my mistake is the fact that this looks somewhat like a cross. And because of what Jesus has done, he's balanced the scales. When we start to talk about what God is calling us to do as a church, it is rooted in what Jesus has done. This, when, when we, what Paul is talking about urging us, there are riches that we have received. There are all these riches in Christ, being part of his family, all these riches that we have received. And he's simply saying, hey, balance the scales. Live in light of the riches that you have received. But we have to continue to remember, church, we're not living to earn those riches. These riches are already here. They're, they're overflowing. It seems like every time I try to put more of these on, they, they just come up because that's just the riches that we have received. So when we talk 
about loving one another and caring for one another. As we get through, as we're talking even this morning, we must keep in view all of these riches that we have in Christ. As we get through chapter four and chapter five, and we talk about relationships, marriage, parents oh, to kids, kids to parents, and, and we get to the armor of God, which you know, maybe we'll have one of the kids read it because they've already memorized that verse when we get to that, that place. All of that happens because of what Christ has done. So let's remember that. Though, though Paul uses this word that talks about a scale, he's, he's saying, let your life be lived in light of these riches. Let your life express the fact that you understand and know the riches that you have in Christ. So then as you look back in your Bibles and Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. We don't see that word called and go, oh, I got to really figure out what God's called me to do because I got I to do that thing. I got to do that. I hope if I do that thing well, then God's going to love me. No, the calling that you've been called. Remember, the calling is that God's called you out of darkness. He did the effort. He sent his son to, who was worthy. You will not be worthy, but he is worthy. And he sacrificed himself for you. So the calling is that he's called you to be a part of his family. You don't have to do something to measure up because Jesus measured up. But when we know the goodness of this, it, it changes the way that we live. So look back at your Bibles. Look back at your Bibles. It's worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And then he gives some attributes that Christ perfectly displayed in his life. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. So in light of this goodness of what Jesus has done and that we're now part of his family, we're no longer far off, we've been brought near, live with humility. What does humility mean? It, it, we're, it's often, humility is often misunderstood. We can often think that humility is like someone who just says, ah, I'm horrible and, you know, don't, uh, you know, they, they think less of themselves. But I love what Tim Keller uh, said, um, he's gone home to be with the Lord, but he defined humility this way. He said, the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. Humility is thinking of myself less. And I might even add, thinking more of others. That's what happened this week at VBS. We had these super servants from our church that weren't thinking of themselves. It was beautiful this week. It was like 80 bajillion degrees outside. It just felt like it was just hot. And if you were in this building, you realized it was because our AC gets on the struggle bus when it's like 90 degrees all day long and the sun's beaten down and so it's warm in here. But they were like, it doesn't matter because I'm not thinking of myself. They were thinking of the kids. They were thinking of the gospel. They wanted the kids to hear the gospel. And so they served. Humility and servanthood go together because you aren't really going to be a servant unless you humble yourself and think of others. So the call is one of humility because for us to be unified as a church, for any church to experience unity, we must experience humility. It starts in our hearts. It's not an action first. It's one that starts in our hearts, aware of what Christ has done. Because in any in any church context, if, if there's pride or self-promotion, it's, it's going to wreak havoc. And our culture tells us to be proud. It tells us that we love the self-made man and, uh, you know, uh, I do all this stuff. And we, uh, talk radio always highlights the arrogant people. You ever notice that? The loud, arrogant people. Well, God's word calls us to reflect Christ. And, and if we are self selfless and humble and committed to the good of others, we're going to experience a unity that's going to, to speak to those who don't know Jesus, that's going to speak to a world that is canceling everybody. What does that look like in your life? Because pride will, will devastate a church. It will devastate relationships. But God calls us out of the goodness of what Christ has done to be humble with all humility and gentleness. Jesus describes himself that way. Jesus says, I am gentle 
and humble in heart. Does that mean that Jesus was, was weak? No, Jesus wasn't weak at all. Yeah, everybody wanted to be around him, but you think about what Jesus did. Storms are going all over the place. Jesus is in a boat sleeping. And then when he gets up, he just says a few words and everything gets calm. One of his disciples cuts the ear off of a Roman guard. He picks up the ear and he, he heals that individual. He healed numerous people. He turned just a few loaves and fish into tons to eat for a large group of people. He had power. But he was gentle because the children wanted to come to him. Even the disciples were like, oh, we, we shouldn't worry about it. He's like, no, let the children come to me. That's how gentle Jesus was. He had this amazing power. That's what gentleness is. It's not using our power for our benefit. It's using the power that God's given us for the benefit of others. How's God calling you to use the strength that he's supplied for you or the resources he's given you to benefit others? Because out of the good, because he's given us all this, not for us to like hoard it in our little bag, but no, that we would generously love and care. May we be humble and gentle. So it says, if you look back at your Bibles, it says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience. Now, I know that you all just love patience. You pray for it, and God gives you all kinds of opportunities to be patient, right? Like, I should be patient. In fact, I stopped praying for it because God kept, keeps giving me these opportunities to be patient, and I don't like them. Do you, do you feel that way? Do you ever, you don't... Because patience sounds like a wonderful word. Like it's patience. It all sounds peaceful. But in the King James, when referencing the fruit of the Spirit, when it translates the word patience, I think it rightly translates the word long-suffering because that's exactly what you feel like when you have to be patient. Is that what you feel like? I am suffering right now. I am suffering because of that person who's in front of me that can't seem to know how to use their blinker or know when to stop. You've never thought that, I'm sure. I'm sure you've never thought that about the person in line at the grocery store who's just like, what, you know, you know, it's, it's not hard. Just scan it. Just get it. Or the person in your small group that just seems to have an ability and, and a vocabulary that's so big that they want to share with everyone and you're just like, why am I having to listen to this? I know you're like, no, we shouldn't think that. We're really godly. Like, I've thought that before. I've been that person before. Someone pointed that out. You know, you're that per. No, I didn't know. Yeah. It was someone who loved me and said, you talk too much. Yeah. Yeah. I was just shared with that in college. So I've had to be aware of that. You're like, oh, you became a preacher. You do lots of talking all the time. We're having to be patient. No. So patience, but that's what God calls us to be with one another. Patient. It, it's going to be hard. Because if you tie it to the next phrase, bearing with one another in love, bearing is not like I'm going to be a bear. No, it's enduring. I'm going to endure with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Why would we endure? Because the riches that we have received just far outweigh any endurance that we must have. Think about how God has endured with you. I think about how God has endured with me. I just recently realized that my 30th high school reunion happened this summer because I was texting with a friend. She's like, are you going to be there? And I was like, no, it, it can't be. I like, I got out my calendar as if I didn't know what year it was. I quickly do the math and I'm like, I'm old and, and I missed it. And I was like, I won't be there. A lot was going on. And I realized, and then I started to, to recount God, look what you've done. Look at, the, look at the individual that I was when I was in college, how immature I was. God blinded Angie, my wife, to say yes. She should not. Like, I was so immature. And I look at different seasons in my life when, you know, early on in our marriage, I, I was impatient and, and unkind to my wife, and God had to do a work in my heart. And just like, I look over time, 30 years that my God was patient with me. 
that my God was bearing with me. Think about your own story. Think about your own story. How God has been patient with you. Or you, just, you just fail. Oh, I fail. I failed again. He doesn't go, hey, you, you failed. End of the line. Not picking you first in dodgeball. Sorry. No. You don't leave his family. Once you're in, you, you're in because you didn't get in because of what you did. You got in because of what Jesus did. And so God is patient with you, and we must think that. How do we, how do we get more patient? There's not a patient pill. There's not a patient verse that we have. Ten, if you just memorize these 10 verses, you will be patient beyond measure. No, it won't feel that way. It will feel like bearing with one another. But we need to commit to that because of Christ's commitment to us. He sent his spirit. Even think about how conviction comes. Well, sometimes conviction feels heavy, but it's never like beat us over the head. The Lord's like, hey, um, I just want to make you aware of that area. Maybe you want to be, uh, he's just so gentle, the Holy Spirit. And so the call is to live in the good of that as we interact with one another, as we bear with one another. Cause, and we need love to do that. Remember last week we, we prayed, as Paul prayed, so that, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. So chapter 3, verse 17, that you being rooted and grounded in love have, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ. Why did Paul pray that? Because we are going to need love to do relationship in the church. We, we need it. It is the glue that holds us together. If you think of Colossians 3, 14, it says this, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Love, love does something. It's like, it's like glue, but not like glue because it just sticks things together. We need it. It also is what we need to cover sin. If you think of 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. How is it that we can forgive our brother or sister in Christ or our spouse or our child or our parents? Or How do we do that? Because you feel that sometimes, right? Like, how am I going to do this? Well, it's love. Not the mushy, gushy, kind of top 10 country music kind of love, but one that endures one that displays self-sacrifice, one that bears with one another. So it's not just tolerating. Sometimes we think bearing one another is just like, okay, I'm just going to hold on. And then as soon as I'm done being in their presence, I can relax. And you just kind of feel it tense. You probably never felt like tension just building, like it's going to jump through your eyeballs. We're just, oh, we're just, I'm just going to endure this and then I can relax. That's not what bearing with one another is. It's seeing that your brothers and sisters in Christ are those for whom Jesus gave his life. So rather than muscling it out, you have compassion because you realize we're all, we're all in this together. We are all on the struggle bus. Can we just acknowledge that? You, you felt that, like I'm, I failed. There's, there's something, I'm not gonna have people raise their hand about ways that they failed and share it with the whole church, but you know, we feel it, you feel that. The struggles that you have, we all have them. We shouldn't be surprised when someone in our small group does something we disagree with or says something that hurts us. We shouldn't be like, oh, I can't believe they did that. They're in church. Do you? Do you realize Jesus had to die for them like he did for you? Do you realize that Jesus is conforming them into the image of his son, which means like they're not done yet. Put them back in the oven, right? Because that's where I am, right? If you pulled me out of the oven right now, nope, not done yet. Put it back in there. Like, because God is at work and God wants to use you to walk with them. As God has used so many people in our lives to walk with us, I think of just so many dear saints that have been kind enough to bear with me and share hard things with me. Like my college pastor, I'll never forget, I would tell him, I'm like, yeah, I want to get to know a bunch of people and I want to, I want to serve and I want to, I want to 
love Jesus, and it was all great and everything. We go on a trip. A bunch of guys went and played paintball, right? Because that's how guys love each other. They just shoot each other. And then, and then uh, later on, he's like, hey, I noticed like on the, on the bus ride back, you didn't talk to anybody. Oh, I was being selfish and self-centered, and he, he loved me enough to bear with me. He didn't go, I'm done with you. He said, hey, just want to make you aware of this, but hey, we're, 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 we're in this together, so let's, let's bear with one another. Let's be committed because of these riches that we have received. Let's be eager, as Paul said, look at verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That means you know, to be eager, it means to have an intense desire, an intense desire, almost like this it, expectancy that's so great, you're like impatient about it. That's the kind of like what eager is talking about. Because our pursuit of unity is not just a passive thing. It's not something that just kind of happens. You have to lean into it. Relationships need to be leaned into because we're all different. I mean, look around. Yeah, I know Americans don't want to do that because you're like, if I look around, what if I, what if I look someone in the eye? Then I have to look at the ground. But if you are sitting here early as people are walking in, we're all different. Different shapes and sizes and backgrounds and family histories and interests and clothing styles and the whole thing. is like, how in the world did we all get here? If you didn't already know, Jesus, that's how we all got here. That's the only reason we are here. I'm only here because of what Jesus has done. And so I want to press into the relationships and be eager because of Christ. So that's why we're called to renounce self-centeredness. We want to get this grand vision of the church that Paul had. He's in prison. He could say a lot of things at this point because he suffered for Christ. And what does he say? I want you to live in light of the good of what Christ has done. Let that bear its fruit in your relationships. Renounce the tyranny of our own agendas. Let's renounce harshness with one another. We'll be talking about speaking the truth in love here in another message or two. But that doesn't mean, well, just got to tell them how it is. No, we're not going to be harsh. Like we're called to be gentle. The church is uni- when the church is unified, God is glorified because we are reflecting Christ. We're reflecting Christ. Remember, Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And as we look at these actions that come out of the riches of who we are, we need to understand our unity is rooted in something amazing. It's actually rooted in the character of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't have time to unpack the Trinity. It, it makes my brain hurt when I think about, how does that mean three distinct persons and they're one? We can't get all, it's into all that, but it's just evident in Scripture, and we see it evident here in the passage. Just take a look at your Bibles, verses 4, 5, and 6. There's one body, meaning referring to the body of Christ. There's one Spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, referring to Jesus, because Jesus is Lord, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So in this, Paul's pointing out, as he talks about these actions that we take out of the goodness of what Jesus has done, like this is root, this unity is rooted in something that that's eternal. Like we God the Spirit is the one that initiates unity for us. God the Son is the foundation for our unity because he's the one that's building the church. He's the one that gave the sacrifice so that we could be all in the family. And and God the Father is the author of it because he's over all. But this unity that we have as it's rooted in the Trinity, why is that important? Well, Dr. Kent Hughes, he kind of unpacked that. He said, What are the implications of our unity being rooted in the Holy Trinity? Simply this. Our unity is eternal and unbreakable. 
It's eternal and unbreakable. In the world, people work really hard to stay together, but, but they just don't. Nations have risen and fallen. Organizations come and go. Businesses come and go. But you know the one thing that lasts? The church. The church has endured countless persecutions. Every, every world leader that's trying to snuff out the church just fans it into flame. Because the church's togetherness, they try to divide the church. They try to sometimes separate Christians and nations where Christians are persecuted. I'm going to put them in solitary confinement. Or I'm going to try to sow seeds of discord. Well, they just lose because our unity is rooted in the Trinity. And so let us reflect the character of God in our midst. Let's understand the significance of why we would pursue unity because it reflects God's character. If you didn't know this, if you didn't know this, you are created in the image of God. Every single person is created in the image of God. Even the ones who don't make it out of the womb before they, they take a breath. They're created in the image of God. You are created in the image of God, and so us walking out this unity is just simply us living out that which we were created to do is to bring him glory and reflect a part of who he is. We can't fully reflect who he is because he is who he is. He's other than us. That's why we sing songs like this morning where we're like, holy, 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 I got to get on my knees because you're just so different. So when you think about unity, think about, think about the magnitude of what that means. Think about the magnitude of who God is. So when, when the temptation comes to, to be Im, impatient, like, wait a minute, like this is so much bigger than my feelings right now. Because this is rooted in God's character and Jesus died for us to be in the same family. You know, church is split over over silly little things because they don't have this grand vision of God and what Christ has done. I read a story recently of, about a church that's, that's split. They got into, I won't get into all the details, uh, you know, it became two factions and they, they got like legal people involved or, uh, you know, so, some of the kind of settled, well, who's going to get what? And so one group got the building and stuff and then this other group started over here and then come to find out, it's like, whoop. What was the deal? What were they so upset about? It all started with a, a, a church meal. And an elder was served a piece of ham that was smaller than the kid that was next to him. You're like, come on. That didn't really happen. I wish, you know, maybe, maybe where I read it, they, they got their figures wrong. But like, it can be that. Now, it doesn't, it's not that. It's not like they split over the piece of ham. That we are splitting over the ham issue. No, it just starts with one thing. It starts with some pride rather than humility. It starts with like, yeah, I got hurt. Well, I'm going to use my strength to get, I'm going to make this right on my own. So it's not gentleness. It's the opposite of that. Uh, it starts with somebody else who's like, I'm not going to be patient with that person. I can't believe they're so revved up about that. I'm going to do something against them and then forget about bearing with one another in love. And then they try to make it about this thing, and, and that thing. That, that's how a church ends up falling into challenges that, that they split over the carpet or the, the piece of ham. That's why we're not going to have ham at the church picnic. <laughs> Hamburgers are not ham. No. Friends, we, we start with Christ. We lean in. We, we want to press in. If you look back at verse 3, let's be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, unity doesn't mean uniformity. So let me explain quickly. It doesn't mean we're all going to look the same. It doesn't mean we're all going to make the same schooling choice for our kids. It doesn't mean our kids are going to choose the same kind of, uh, you know, college or career or whatever kind of choice. It doesn't mean we're going to all dress the same. It doesn't mean we're all going to by the same products of whatever. No, it means we are unified because of what Christ has done. There's going to be tons of diversity in the midst of it. It doesn't mean that we have to be completely uniform, but there is a unity that happens. If you were to gather some of the great saints of old, you've heard names like Augustine, who was a theologian from 
Africa, and then you've, you've heard of Martin Luther, or maybe Charles Spurgeon, or you've probably heard of Billy Graham. If you got all those guys in a room, I bet they would disagree about some stuff. They would. But I bet they would be like, yeah, these things don't separate us because we're all here because of what Jesus has done. So let us be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. It means spare no effort. God is calling us to be zealous, to remind one another of all these riches. Remind one another about all these riches. Certainly we'll challenge one another to do things in our actions, but, but we want the emphasis to be on the riches of what Christ has done. That's why when you're in small group and someone's sharing about a struggle, or you're aware, make sure they're aware of the gospel. Make sure they're aware. If they're aware of anything, if, they, if you give them no action steps, just give them one. Make sure you look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. One theologian, uh, his name is Marcus Barth, says it's hardly possible to render exactly what this word eager is in the original. It, it not only means haste and passion, but it means full effort. It means like the whole man. It, it means everything full of strength, your total attitude. It excludes being passive. It excludes being see. It means, uh, you know, mean it, do it. No, no, you should really mean it. You should really do it. That's what this eagerness, it's like leaning in. It means there's no room for factions or hatreds or rivalries. Because if you look at the passage, it says, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In the bond of peace. We're called, friends, to be peacemakers. We're called to be peacemakers. Because as Proverbs says, I was just reading this in my devotions this week, just where it came up in my Bible reading plan. Proverbs 6.19 says, God hates one who sows discord among brothers. That's pretty stark. God hates the one who sows discord. But yet there's blessing that comes with the one who pursues peace. We want to be peacemakers. We want to... Be honest with one another. The peacemaker is honest with their brother and sister in Christ. It's easy to just avoid problems. Have you ever felt that? Oh, there's this issue. I think I should say something. I'm kind of not settled about it. Maybe someone said something to you. Maybe someone said something about you. Maybe you're observing something and you're just like, I just... And when you see them... You have a list of things that you maybe even wrote it down. These are the things I'm going to say to them. And then you see them and you're just like, hey, it's great. Did you notice it was hot this week? And, and then you don't say a word. Have you ever been like, I've been like that. I've been tempted to do that this week. But peacemakers are honest. We're willing to take the step. We're willing to endure some pain because that, because when we do that, it does. We do. We do run the risk of getting hurt. We run the risk of saying something. We're going to get hurt. If I say something to them, they might just snap back at me, and I don't. I don't. I don't really want to do that today. Right? I just want to go sit by the pool. But we have to be willing to endure pain. Why? Because it was the will of the Lord to crush him. It was the will of the Lord to crush Jesus. Jesus endured. Jesus knew. Jesus didn't want it. Jesus said, Lord, I, is there another way? He, he prayed so passionately, he stripped drops of blood, and he said, no, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. May we be willing to endure pain. And sometimes that pain is us humbling ourselves and saying, I need to own my part. I need to own my part. I was part of this. Husbands, you might need to do that this afternoon. There might be something that's happened this week. You need to go to your wife and you need to say, I, I need to own it. Not, but, and you, just, just so you're aware, I need you to be aware of your thing. No, just own it. That's hard to do, men. I know it's hard to do because I've had to do it a lot. I've been married for 26 years. It's painful. 
You may have to do that in other relationships. The peacemaker is going to willing to endure pain because we are bearing with one another in love. And a peacemaker is going to be persistent because as you are eager, we're going to lean in. The scriptures are pretty clear about this. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live, peace, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you, that kind of leaves out no excuses. There's no buts in that verse. And Romans 4, 19. Make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Be aggressive at pursuing peace. Now, I know relationships are hard. Why do you think it is so nice to not have to go out and get anything? You just find it on the internet, click, groceries and, you know, various days of the year that it seemed like a, a new holiday has arrived because everything's 25% off and you need to go and you don't have to see a single person to do it. Our culture's taken away all the, the ways that we have interacted with people in normal ways. We no longer even know the person who slices the meat that we eat. Like there's just gonna be that tension. I get relationships are hard, but let's make every effort because Jesus made the full effort that we could be here today. Let's lean in. You know, I think of a couple friends of mine who, they were part of the same church. They both had served in leadership positions. And uh, at one point, a number of years ago, the one friend, he felt this burden. He wanted to go plan a church, not too far away from his local church, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. I, I can't remember how. Far enough away where they lived that, you know, it, it easily could have planted the church and not affected at, but you know, so he, that's what he was feeling burdened to do. And his other friend was like, no, I don't think you should go. He's like, I think you should invest more here. You are needed here to help and help raise up some of the younger folks. And so if you look at both of their arguments, because I knew both of them, you want to know who was right? Both of them, Fred and Barney, that wasn't their names, but Fred and Barney were both right. Like, you could see the argument. And eventually Fred went and planted the church. And, and there was just tension that was there. Like, they both loved Jesus, and they're like, there, there shouldn't be tension here, but there's just tension here. And it was kind of just getting thicker, and maybe they weren't as inclined to talk to one another. And Fred was like, look, I believe what this says. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Wilma! Come with me. Fred and Wilma went to Barney and Betty's house and said, we are going to sit down and we are going to talk. We are going to press in. I get that we don't agree on this thing. But we are friends because of what Jesus has done. We've been friends for years because of what Jesus has done. And I'm not going to let this good thing, even a good thing. So this wasn't a bad thing. It was a good thing. Talking about planting a church, reaching people for Jesus. I'm not going to let this even good thing get in between us. I'm going to be eager, and we are going to press in. And, I, and I've talked to Barney about this, and I'm like, hey, Barney, like, how, how is it that you, know, you navigated through that? He's like, honestly, it's all Fred. He's like, I saw that tendency. I was going to you know, start to drift and be like, well, he's just going to be there, and we're not going to have this relationship. But you know what Fred did? Fred was like, this is not going to happen. Friends, do you have that kind of zeal of commitment for the relationships that you have in the local church? Do you have that? Are you willing to get involved to the degree that it might get messy and might hurt? I get it. it it's, it's hard. But our eyes aren't on the individual person. Our eyes need to be on Christ. Our eyes need to be on Christ who perfectly displayed humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love. So if you're here and you're new and you're just like, I don't know. I don't even know you. I just came to watch my grandchild sing. You're in the right place. We don't have to be the same. We just have the same Lord who's brought us into the same family, which means we have the same Father. 
and we walk together. If you came this morning and you feel lonely or alienated or judged or marginalized, you're going to continue to feel that as you walk in the world. But church, let's look to Christ. Let's look at the multitude of the riches that we have received. And yes, these are filled with chocolate. So for some of you, these became like magnanimous riches, right? Let's look at the riches that we have received and may it change the way that we press into our relationships with one another. Because as the church lives this out, humility with gentleness, with patience, and I get we're in process, we're growing. No one's gonna walk out of here and be like, yeah, all of a sudden it was amazing. We heard one message and I'm humble and gentle and I'm patient. It's a process. It's a process for me. But the world's gonna see something different and they're gonna be like, what is going on here? This isn't happening in other places. Why is this happening? It's not happening because something I'm doing, or it's not happening because some of the elders are doing, or small group leaders, or folks who are serving. It's happening because God is at work and Jesus is at work. And let's just come, let's come like Francis of Assisi. I read this quote, St. Francis of Assisi, he wrote this. He understood this call to actively pursue peace. He said, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hate, may I bring love. Where offense, may I bring pardon. May I bring union in place of discord. Friends, let's respond to God's call as Paul made the call to the Ephesians. Where he said, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And as we walk to be worthy, we are not walking to earn something because it's been earned for us. We're not walking to pay off a debt because the debt was paid for us. We're living in the good of what Christ has done. And let's walk it out with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I love you, and I'm so excited that I get to walk this out with you. Let's pray. Father, you have done amazing things. The most amazing thing you did was selflessly sacrifice your one and only son for us. May we never forget that. May we always keep that in view. So I ask God that you would come and just may we tangibly be aware of you. May we tangibly be aware of you as we, as we come before you right now. These, these things before us are hard. I, I feel it. Even talking about humility and patience and gentleness and bearing with one another, they're hard. They're hard things, God. We need you. We need you. God, would you do that work in us, that which is pleasing in your sight. May you be glorified by any fruit that happens and give us the grace. Give us the grace and the strength to walk out unity, to bring glory to your name, Lord. And may we just sense your pleasure and enjoy the peace that you bring. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name.